Hello, everybody, and welcome to week 15 of History 212. It's been a strange semester. Uh, certainly, it is ending in a way that I had not anticipated, and I don't think any of us could have. Uh, but here we are in the final week. So today, in this lecture, what I'll be talking about is the final battles of the Civil War, how it ultimately all gets wrapped up, and then talk about Reconstruction and the effort to create a multiracial democracy in the United States. So the Civil War will end with a victory for the Union and the end of slavery, but Reconstruction will ultimately be a significant disappointment in what it is able to achieve. And so before we explore all of that, just a reminder that if you haven't taken the fourth quiz already, you should do so. Uh, I will have your papers returned to you soon if you have submitted them. If you have not and haven't spoken to me about that already, then please do uh, get in contact. Make sure also to participate in the final week's discussion board. In addition, keep an eye out for the final exam. That will be opening at the beginning of next week in finals week, and you'll have until the end of finals week uh, to take the exam. I would highly recommend downloading and reading through the study guide before uh, taking the exam. Uh, it will work much the same way as the midterm exam did, though I do want to stress that the short answer portion will not be cumulative. It will just cover material from uh, after the midterm, but the essay question will be cumulative. It will ask you to draw on things from at the entirety of the course. So that business out of the way, let's get to the end of the American Civil War. First, something that is worth noting that can often be lost in the grand historical picture of the American Civil War is that neither the Union or the Confederacy were entirely united internally in the conflict. So within the South, within the states of the Confederacy, there were those who had not wanted to secede in the first place. Many of these are poorer farmers who feel that they are being asked to make sacrifices for the wealthy plantation owners that had always economically dominated them. There's many also who simply have a strong attachment to the United States and don't want to leave for the sake of slavery. Now, many of these anti-Confederacy communities are located in the Appalachian Mountain area. So in North Carolina, we're talking about the western portion of the state, and in Tennessee, the eastern portion of the state. Uh, in both of these cases, you have communities that resist uh, the draft that the Confederacy eventually levies to try and fill out the ranks of its army, uh, and you have active combat between Unionists in the South and the Confederate government. The tactics that the Confederate government uses to put down these revolts are quite harsh in themselves uh, because they can't fight both the Union and their internal enemies. Uh, beyond these insurrectionary conflicts, the kind of guerrilla campaigns that break out in the Appalachian region, more broadly, there's a good number of Southerners who resist secession on a variety of different grounds. Some oppose slavery, some simply feel a greater sense of loyalty to the United States. So with the exception of South Carolina, every state of the Union contributes troops to the Union cause. So there is a Virginian regiment fighting for the Union, a Louisiana or a regiment fighting for the Union. There are generals who had been Southerners, or who were Southerners, you know, born and raised, and yet still maintained their attachment to the United States as a whole rather than their particular section. So while that's good for the perspective of the Union, the Union itself is not also entirely united. So I discussed last week, and one of the points in the discussion board was about the transformation of the war beyond the goal of preserving the Union to the two goals of preserving the Union and ending slavery creating what Lincoln called the new birth of freedom. Now, many in the North were thrilled to see this, went along with it. It gave uh, increased power to the moral force of the Union armies. Uh, it 
gave practical power to the Union armies as many African Americans uh, joined and fought for the Union. Uh, but there were also those who opposed this, especially uh, Democrats, peace Democrats, who were called copperheads as an insult. That's a kind of venomous snake. Uh, these copperheads argued that there should be a negotiated peace and that the main priority was the reunification of the Union. Uh, and they recognized correctly that by making the end of slavery an, a, a goal of the Union in the war, it meant that the South was going to resist longer and harder. Because as long as the South held any kind of dream of maintaining the slave society that had existed before the war, they would continue to fight. Now, Lincoln made the calculation that it was better to bear the costs of this continued fight and end slavery once and for all than it would be to try and negotiate a lesser peace. Uh, but he did not have universal support in that. Uh, so throughout the war, there's a division between uh, those in favor of continuing the fight and those who want a negotiated peace. I should say this is not the entirety of the Democrats. It's a specific faction of peace Democrats, the Copperheads. There's a large number of pro-war Democrats who argue that the war has to be carried to its successful conclusion. So this is the kind of overall political background that's useful to keep in mind heading into 1864. Now where we left off was Gettysburg, but things are going to be different now. So the Vicksburg campaign, which had been in the West and had ended in a uh, triumphant Union success, elevated the man you see on the slide here, Ulysses S. Grant. Now Grant had been a business failure prior to the war, uh, he was a veteran of the Mexican-American War, but left the army and hadn't been able to really make anything work in civilian life. He was widely seen as a drunk, and he certainly does appear to have been an alcoholic, though capable of controlling his drinking while actually on campaign. There's no sign that he was ever drunk while he was in command. Uh, but he was famously stubborn and famously calm. That is a very useful combination of, of traits to have in a commanding officer. Because while others would be kind of losing their head, Grant would slowly size up the situation and decide what to do. Uh, one of his contemporaries said that Grant always carried a look of determination about him, not always in the most flattering way. He said Grant looked like he was about to uh, put his head through a wall and was just gearing himself up to do it. So after his success at Vicksburg, Lincoln brings Grant East to fight in the theater where, despite the victory at Gettysburg, the Union has had the most difficult time making inroads. Grant is appointed overall commander of U.S. armies, the, the lieutenant general in charge of, of everything. And so George Meade, who had been the commander at Gettysburg, he's still the commander of the main army in the East, the Army of the Potomac. But Grant is in command of everything, and he decides that he is going to put his own central focus in the East. And Grant also has come to the conclusion, after the years of the war that have already passed, that this conflict is not going to be won by maneuver. It's not going to be won in a single battle. It will be won when the Southern army is ground down to the point that it is no longer capable of resistance. And he also does the calculation that the North simply has more men and more resources than the South does. Now, this calculation he makes often leads to Grant, and unfairly in my opinion, being dismissed as a, a butcher, as somebody who just threw waves of men without a thought to grand strategy behind it. That's really not the case. Grant is strategically one of the better generals in U.S. history, and he's capable of striking maneuvers. But in his maneuvers, he takes into account the fact that he can afford losses, and Lee really can't. Lee, uh, Grant knows he can replace those soldiers who die, and Lee is not really capable of that. This is what's known as a war of attrition, basically grinding down your enemy into nothing. 
Uh, it's also known as total war, you know, throwing everything that you have societally against your enemy. Representative of this belief is the first major campaign that Grant leads in the East, the Overland Campaign, where Grant takes a massive army and marches it south into Virginia, and he fights a series of battles against Lee. And in each of these fights, Grant does not succeed in his objective of driving Lee from the field, which technically, in the classic military terms, means their defeats. But Grant isn't thinking in classic military terms because the point of his maneuvers is to destroy Lee's army. So as long as Lee's army is there, he's going to keep attacking it. And the main difference between him and other Union commanders is they would fight. If they suffered a reverse, they'd retreat. Grant kept going even after taking losses or losing a particular battle, because he was thinking of the war as a whole, rather than as at one isolated point of conflict. And because of this approach, he's able to, over time, drive Lee back, eventually driving Lee into defensive positions in the town of Petersburg, Virginia, which is a vital point of defense for the Confederate capital of Richmond. Lee hunkers down in Petersburg, and he and his army build defensive works, trenches, you know, uh, earthen mounds, because, you know, kind of traditional walls could now at this point be easily destroyed by artillery. And ironically, the only thing that was really worthwhile was just a lot of earth packed together. And so they create a fortification against Grant's army. And Grant tries but fails to break through these fortifications, and so he makes the decision to start digging in opposite Lee's lines. And they create a long line of opposing trenches that circle around Petersburg, that prevent the Union Army from being able to break through and make their way to Richmond. Now this siege of Petersburg is going to last from the summer of 1864 until the uh, March 25th of 1865. You know, it's not really until the end of the war that Lee is weak enough for Grant to break through. But this still works out within Grant's plan, because as long as Lee's army is locked down in Petersburg, he's in control of the situation. And as long as Lee's army is stuck in Petersburg, he's losing men. People are dying of disease, they're dying of combat. Many men are deserting his army, that this is seeming more and more like a hopeless cause. And the kind of war is just demoralizing in its own right. So Lee's army is slowly fading from strength, and Grant is deciding to wait him out and pressure him. Now, there are efforts to break the siege earlier. Uh, there was one spectacularly poorly thought out plan to destroy the works by digging a tunnel under them and uh, exploding them. With the explosion part actually worked out pretty well, but the Union troops that were sent to exploit the hole in the lines ran through the hole instead of around it, and then ended up being stuck in there and easy prey for the Confederacy. But those kinds of moments aside, Grant's strategy was fairly sound. But it is a static strategy. It's a long-term strategy, and it's a costly one. And 1864 is an election year. So where is Lincoln going to find hope for the war to convince people to still be patient with him, to elect him to a second term to carry the war to its conclusion? And while it doesn't have a particularly political goal in mind when it starts, where Lincoln will get his hope is again in the West, and as the West comes East. And this is the famous March to the Sea. So the March to the Sea is the brainchild of Grant's friend and subordinate officer, William T. Sherman. Sherman is, in many ways, Grant's opposite. He's more excitable. People actually thought he was insane when the war started because he told everybody that the war was going to be bloodier and longer than they could possibly imagine. And like Grant, Sherman starts thinking about the war in terms beyond the traditional ways of just uh, 
you know, fighting this army or that army or taking this city or that city. And he becomes convinced that the way to break the Confederacy is to break the will of their home front. That as long as the people of the South support the Confederacy, the war can continue and drag on and support uh, the troops that he's fighting. So Sherman takes his army and begins a campaign from the west to the east, marching through the state of Georgia and lighting on fire anything valuable in terms of cotton that he can find or ammunition stores. Now, this is often depicted incorrectly as just wholesale slaughter. Sherman does not massacre the people of the South as he's marching through. He does burn cities. Uh, he burns Atlanta, though that apparently fire started by, you know, uh, not necessarily a deliberate plan, but it just, it, it picked up. Uh, and he definitely deliberately destroyed the capital of South Carolina when he reached it, uh, Columbia, South Carolina. But this isn't about killing the people, or even depriving them all of food. Uh, he gives orders not to, you know, take enough food from people on the way, on the march, uh, that they'd starve to death. And we know that he disciplines soldiers who commit acts against the civilian population. So this is not like, you know, Europe in World War II. But it is a fight against the economic heart of the South. It's making the South hurt. Uh, beyond just the battles that they've been fighting. And it's also a demonstration to the South that their armies are no longer strong enough to protect their territory, and the Union can go where it will and do what it wants. All the way across this battle, uh, across this march, the Confederate armies fall back before Sherman. And when the commander who's been falling back is replaced with someone who will attack, the Western Confederate Army is essentially destroyed in a headlong fight against the much stronger Union Army. Sherman eventually takes Savannah, Georgia, and then starts marching back north, going, like I said, into South Carolina. And this is one of the most remarkable and most successful military operations in U.S. history. And he had seized Atlanta, which was a major railroad hub, prior to the election of 1864. So that election is probably unlike any U.S. presidential election that we've ever had, or maybe even will ever have, though I, I guess 2020 is going to be plenty weird. Uh, Lincoln doesn't formally run as a Republican for his second term, but as a member of the National Union Party. And his vice presidential candidate is a Democrat named Andrew Johnson, who is from Tennessee and who didn't particularly care about ending slavery, but had wanted to remain with the Union. And so he is a, uh, a balancing on the ticket. Lincoln is trying to emphasize unity. His opponent is one of the generals that he had fired, George McClellan, who had conducted numerous operations against Lee of questionable uh, efficiency. And McClellan's main argument against Lincoln is that he's not able to win, that the Civil War will keep going on, as long uh, without a prospect for success, and that there should be a negotiated peace. This is the overall take of, you know, the Copperhead faction of the Democratic Party, though McClellan is not really consistent on this, and at points McClellan will insist that he'll carry out the war to a successful conclusion, even if a lot of people who are voting for him are voting on kind of the hope that things will end with negotiation. Regardless of what McClellan would have done, the success of Sherman especially, but the support of the army, which has a huge portion of the population of the North at this point, provides critical support to Lincoln. He wins the election of 1864, and at this point it is clear the war is going to be carried out to its successful conclusion, because by this point it is clear it is only a matter of time and willpower both of which the Union possesses. And when, in 1865, Grant finally breaks through the lines at Petersburg, Lee is forced to retreat into Virginia. And he doesn't get very far before he finds himself confronted by a Union force he simply doesn't have the men or resources to defeat. And so, at the Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia, Lee 
formally surrenders to Grant. Now, the owner of the Appomattox Courthouse had bought this house and moved there after his house at the start of the war had been the site of the first major battle, the Battle of Bull Run. Just one of those little historical ironies that works out. Uh, Grant would later record the scene in his memoirs. And I want you to read that. It's one of the documents that's on Blackboard and not in the, uh, the textbook. And look at what Grant is trying to accomplish in order to help reconciliation occur. You know, now that the Union has won, how do they bring the South effectively back into the Union? And think also about Lee's perspective on this. What does Lee think is necessary for the Union to really exercise the control that it wants uh, to exercise? So this is not the official end of the Civil War. There are still combat troops in the field. But by the end of April, the last forces have surrendered. And the final kind of Confederate stragglers are, you know, finally brought to heel at the end of May of 1865. But before that, there will be one more notable death, which is that shortly after this surrender, Abraham Lincoln is assassinated by John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Uh, Booth was a famous actor, but he was also a diehard Southern sympathizer, and he managed to sneak into the president's box at the theater and shoot Lincoln in the back of the head. So the war claimed at least one more victim. It was one more victim of many. Uh, the Civil War is the bloodiest war in American history. Over 200,000 people died in combat. Uh, over 625,000 died in total. Uh, disease was a major killer at the time, uh, which is vastly more than died during World War II. Uh, also, when you consider that the population was significantly smaller than uh, it was during World War II. And all this means that about 5% of the entire U.S. population was killed. And those losses fell heaviest on men aged between 16 and 35. So there's a you know, major gap in a generation here. Uh, and in addition to the dead, there are the wounded. The records of the wounded are often fragmentary, but there are you know, basically on every street corner after the Civil War. There are people who are missing limbs, people who are unable to kind of uh, support themselves anymore. We, we see actually government action to support wounded veterans. Uh, in a strange bit of historical trivia, the last Confederate veterans pension to support, you know, kind of soldiers after the war wasn't paid out until 2006 because a Confederate veteran married when he was in his 90s a woman who was in her teen years, and she was able to continue carrying on uh, receiving his benefits. So this is uh, you know, still long ago, but not quite as long ago as you might expect. And now that there has been this carnage, the question is, well, what comes next? Slavery is over. Prior to Lincoln's death, he had managed to get through Congress the 13th Amendment banning slavery. But the idea of what Reconstruction will actually mean, well, that's not clear. There's a Freedmen's Bureau that's set up that's supposed to help formerly enslaved people, you know, kind of get up on their feet, find family members. That's one of the things that is a high priority for most of these newly freed people, finding the family members that had been torn from them when slavery existed. Getting an education is another major goal. But the Freedmen, uh, Freedmen's Bureau is fairly limited in its power and its scope, uh, and African Americans have to figure this out themselves in many cases. They also have the problem that they don't necessarily have any economic base to start from because they did not have uh, money in slavery. Now, Sherman, on his march to the sea, when he was encountering many freed slaves, uh, called for, in fact promised, 40 acres and a mule for each freed slave family, uh, for each uh, newly free family, I should say, uh, and that this would be enough to get them started as small farmers. That land would be seized 
from southern major landholders. Uh, but ultimately, that uh, policy is revoked. Sherman didn't really have the authority to uh, establish it in the first place. And so many of these African Americans who had been freed from slavery continue to work on plantations now as sharecroppers. The other fact of the matter is that the president of the United States who succeeds Lincoln, Andrew Johnson, is not too concerned with the plight of the formerly enslaved people. Uh, and he is content to sit back while southern states enact what are called black codes. Now, the goal of the black codes is to essentially try to create a legal situation that's as close to slavery as possible. So it prevents African Americans from voting, from the full benefits of citizenship. It passes vagrancy laws, which basically is if you are president and don't have a job, you can be imprisoned. And if you're imprisoned, you can be sold out as labor, which is pretty much just a workaround of trying to get slavery back. Johnson faces immense pushback because of his uh, you know, relaxed attitude to what's going on in the South. Ultimately, Johnson is impeached by the House of Representatives, which then goes to the Senate for trial, and he only manages to avoid being ejected from office after one vote short is cast against him. Uh, so Johnson narrowly survives the impeachment trial, uh, but he ultimately is a spent force politically. Because in opposition to his overly soft approach to Reconstruction, many re Republicans managed to win in midterm elections in 1866. The fact that they were able to impeach Johnson speaks to their success. And we see the beginning of a new phase of Reconstruction. So the first phase is presidential, and it's a, a weak phase of Reconstruction. What we see start now is radical Reconstruction, called such as it was run by the so-called radical Republicans. Now, what was radical about them was that they believed African Americans deserved the full rights of citizenship uh, now that they were freed from enslavement. And so from 1867 to 77, the South is divided into five military districts. New state governments are created, they are all forced by law to accept that uh, black men can vote, though no women can vote yet. Uh, and because black people can vote, and in many states, they're actually a majority of the population at this point, uh, there are African-American office holders, uh, African-American Republicans. Now, this is both a question of political principle for the radical Republicans, but it's also practical politics because they know that when the South reintegrates into the nation, Southern whites are not going to vote for them. They have to rely on African Americans as people who will exercise political power in these uh, newly established, uh, or I should say newly reintegrated states. Now, Johnson loses the president, uh, he doesn't even actually run for president in 1868. Ulysses S. Grant becomes the 18th president, and while Grant is uh, definitely all for carrying out this Reconstruction program, this is still very much a congressionally-led response. It just now has support from the president instead of opposition from the president. It's during this period that the Congress passes what are known as the Reconstruction Amendments, or I should say the latter two. The first Reconstruction Amendment was the 13th which abolished slavery in the whole Union, uh, kind of building on and solidifying the Emancipation Proclamation. The 14th is kind of a grab bag that's meeting a lot of different problems from the end of the war, including things like representation and debt, but the most important part is citizenship. It says, every American citizen is a citizen by right of having been born in the United States. So if you're born in the United States, you're a citizen. And that means that if you were enslaved and born into slavery, now you are a citizen of the United States. And furthermore, if you're a citizen of the United States, then individual state governments don't have the right to deprive you of your rights. This is a new perspective on the Bill of Rights. 
So this is something we talked about back when we were all still in the classroom. The Bill of Rights originally only protected you from the federal government. The federal government couldn't do the things that the Bill of Rights uh, laid out. But states still could. That's how southern states, for example, could pass laws banning abolitionist discussion, which is a violation of the freedom of speech. Uh, so now, though, the federal government isn't just what you're protected from, but it's what's providing protection for these other rights. The federal government has the authority now to say to states, you can't do what you're doing if they're violating the rights of their individual residents. The 15th Amendment solidifies the right to vote, which is seen as kind of a cornerstone of Reconstruction because there needs to be continual African-American voting to keep this going. So I said that this ended disappointedly. Now, how does that happen? Well, there are those in the South who argue that it is useful to kind of adapt to the new order. White Southerners who are seeking to cooperate with African-American Republicans with Northerners coming down to rebuild the economy, to make an industrial economy in the South. But they face a determined opposition from radical whites who cannot accept, who will not accept, the changed status of the South. A variety of different groups form up that are essentially terrorist groups, that are trying to establish or reestablish their authority by cowing those uh, who are outside of the protection of the Union. So threatening to kill, or and actually killing, African Americans who vote. Uh, pulling down all the power they can get to intimidate African Americans, or Northerners, or pro-reconciliation whites. The Ku Klux Klan is the most famous of these organizations, but it's not the only one. And it gets to the point that when there are contested elections in the 1870s, there's actually open battles between white supremacist elements who had been trying to rig the elections and between Republicans, uh, which especially means African-American Republicans. Over time, this terrorism, even though the government under Grant acts strongly to try and suppress it, this terrorism does reduce support in the North for the continuation of Reconstruction, because for it to continue, there needs to be troops that are still in the South, combat that are still in the South. In some ways, you know, this is a continuation of the war by other means, that now that the Union has totally demonstrated its military superiority, the South is using irregular tactics. Now, not necessarily the Southern governments, but these, you know, disorganized groups you know, fighting a, a kind of fight that we would today recognize in some of the conflicts that are still occurring in the world. Uh, now, on top of the terrorism that weakens commitment to Reconstruction uh, in the North and prevents African Americans from voting in the South, there's also economic uncertainty and economic chaos, which leads to increasing discontent across the United States with the predominantly Republican government. And so, in 1877, when there's a disputed presidential election, the Republican candidate Rutherford B. Hayes agrees to end the last military zone in the South in exchange for support for the presidency. And then over the course of the 1880s, the African-American Republican governments lose power and support. And what are installed instead are white supremacist governments uh, that restrict voting, not by race, but by imposing requirements that they know will fall disproportionately on African Americans. So while Reconstruction had attempted and had temporary successes in creating a real multiracial democracy, it ultimately collapsed under the weight of reaction. But we should see some of the uh, arguments of the African Americans themselves of what they're continuing to fight for. The readings for, uh, some of the readings for class today from Jordan Anderson, a freed slave who was basically explaining his conditions to a former master of his who had written him a letter asking him to come back and work as an employee on his farm, or Sojourner Truth who is still advocating for African-American rights. I want you to read these and see what they suggest about the battles 
still to be fought for civil rights in the United States. Frederick Douglass, who continues to be an advocate for civil rights for the rest of his life, when asked what should be the responsibility of Americans who want to keep improving things, African Americans who want to keep improving their lot in life, women who want to get access to political rights, Douglas's advice is agitate, you know, agitate, always fight, and continue the struggle onwards. Now, this is the last slide of the last lecture you know, of the you know, end of our class. And I think that that's a, a good note to end on because let's reflect on what we've seen over the course of this class. You know, you have a variety of different groups settling North America for a variety of different you know, religious, political, economic reasons and creating a new society, uh, one that eventually rebelled in the American Revolution and created a new form of government. And it was a government that was based on an ideology, not blood, not, you know, necessarily shared religion, not a king, but on ideas that it often failed to live up to, but that we still see people like Lincoln. We still see people, you know, like Douglas, like William Lloyd Garrison, like Marie Child, who are struggling to keep making it better. And that's something that, you know, Douglas says is essentially uh, a fight that's going to continue to happen. And we can look back at Lincoln talking about the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln says that all men are created equal as something that the Declaration of Independence assert, uh, asserts is something that's intended for everybody and over time will be expanded even to all men and women are created equal as is only just. And Lincoln says that because that wasn't the case when those words were first uttered. What's clear to him is that that's a proposition. That's a thesis, an argument, if we want to put it in academic terms. The thesis that all people are created equal. And it hadn't been the reality when it was said, but he says it's something to strive toward, to keep working for. That it doesn't mean nothing simply because the people who uh, expressed that idea weren't able to live up to it fully because that process of living up to it is one that requires continued struggle and continued effort. And we can see the kind of evolution of our government, the evolution of rights within that government, and the evolution of those ideas is better trying to fulfill that uh, mission statement. Uh, at least that's something that I, I think is worthwhile to think on as we reach the end of the class, and I hope it's something that has uh, improved your perspective or changed your perspective on American history and the utility of studying it. That by studying this, we can kind of better understand that long ongoing struggle uh, to actually make this country you know, live up to its own ideals. Uh, and we see in the Civil War, the end of slavery, but a challenge that will continue. Uh, and so with that, we'll end this class, we'll end this lecture. If you have any questions, as ever, please feel free to contact me. And just on a personal note, I hope you all have a good summer, that you stay safe, healthy, and that are with you know, families who stay safe and healthy, uh, and that in this you know, period of uncertainty, you have uh, some measure of security. And so, farewell, and best of luck with the future, especially your future at Ashland University.